Hi, and welcome to the Animal Training Academy podcast show, the show for animal training and behavior nerds, where I, Ryan Cartledge, interview the world's most proficient animal training and behavior geeks. We're absolutely thrilled and grateful to have you here with us today. So make sure you hit that subscribe button on whatever you're listening to this on so that you don't miss a single episode. Each episode of this show is brought to you on behalf of the ATA membership. And if you like the conversations in this episode, then you're invited to continue them with a like-minded behavior nerds within the membership area, which you can find out more about at www.animaltrainingacademy.com. You'll get access to twice monthly live web classes, the back catalog of previous web class replays, plus a huge library of videos and projects to help problem solve your training challenges. Plus, we're a sociable bunch with an exclusive private Facebook group and forum areas. It's like a Netflix social media platform for animal behavior geeks. But we will get started on today's episode where we will be talking to one Chris Shank. Chris has a background in animal training, having attended the Exotic Animal Training and Management Program at Moore Park College in California. She went on to become a dolphin trainer, all the while caring for her flock of 40 mixed species white cockatoos and breeding them for sale. While she no longer breeds birds, she continues to free fly her cockatoos and has been doing so for 40 years. Chris keeps up her training skills by working with her flock as well as her horse and donkey using primarily positive reinforcement training. She learns as much as she can about the four quadrants of training and their use and effects on our learners. She does so by attending training clinics, be they about parrots, dogs, chickens or horses. Chris operates Cockatoo Downs in Dallas, Oregon, a parrot educational facility. So without further ado, it's my very great pleasure to welcome Chris Shank to the show today. She's patiently waiting by. Chris, thank you so much for taking the time to hang out with us here at Animal Training Academy. Well, it's my pleasure, Ryan. It truly is. Um, You have a wonderful company and you offer so much good information to the training world out there that I'm honored to be a little tiny bit of part of it. So, yeah, I hope I can add some interest to um, parrot keeping people out there and, and maybe change some minds or not. doesn't matter. But, uh, yeah, I'm glad to be here. Take some approximations towards changing minds. that might be changed in the future. I've, I've seen your videos online. I've seen cockatoos flying around at your facilities uh, from from other friends of mine who visit you um, seen photos of you hanging out with Susan Friedman and Peggy Hogan two great mentors and friends of mine uh, and I know that you am I correct to live next door or down the road from Pamela Clark mm-hmm, that's correct <laughs> it's, yeah. it's it's a very parrot orientated street then I would imagine <laughs> yeah 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 we're very very fortunate to um, <clears throat> be friends and uh, have the ability to meet here at Cockatoo Downs and share our knowledge. Especially, it's quite an honor to have Peggy and Susan here. I mean, it's like, oh, <laughs> it's huge. So I, I truly enjoy that. And, and uh, it's very informal. You know, we don't do anything uh, highfalutin conferences or anything like that. It's just just a group of people getting together and uh, participants who want to be here. And we just sit around and talk training and actually do some training once in a while in between our talks. So we do have a lot of fun. Yeah, well, we don't need formalness to learn, do we? we That's, need... right. That's right. <laughs> we just need our hands, our ears, our eyes, our mouths and some good yeah. company. Yeah, that's it. It's very motivating. So I feel like, anyway, with all of that being said uh, and all of those uh, pieces of the jigsaw puzzle I think there's a terrible metaphor but it's all that I've got at the moment so I'm going to go with it uh, that, that have been put together uh, this episode has been a while in the making I'm excited that we're finally doing it so let's dive in and 
go backwards in time. Can you take us back to where you got started? 40 years you've been free-flying parrots. Where, where did you first learn about positive reinforcement uh, training? And, right. and can you share right. stories well, from your experience? It, it, it was at, at um, the Exotic Animal Training and Management Program. And I was the first, I was in the first class or the first year that this was offered. This uh, two-year program was offered. So that was when Bill Brisby was there and there was a field that um, he had the school put up a trailer and we built some pens and that was it. And I heard about this this program. I had already graduated college. I was an English major and I was at a loss at what to do. I mean, it, it was ridiculous. So I read about this program and we I had to go through the interview process you know and and uh, and there were I think tw- I want to say 20 people that were chosen 15 maybe anyway I I was one of them <laughs> so um, it was quite something and part of the program was learning how to to train um, using positive reinforcement. And, and until then, I was so naive about the science of behavior, the science of training. And, and, and again, that was 40 years ago. So there wasn't much out there. And uh, so we learned that um, in school. And our, one of the projects was to train a rat to do a series of behaviors. And um, we all did. We all had a rat and we all trained them. At the time, uh, the Olympics was going on. So I I trained my rat to do a series of, you know, jumping through hoops and hanging off of a high bar and, you know, all sorts of silly little things. But it was a big hit, not just me, but the other trainers as well. It was a big hit and we were in the newspaper and it was, it was kind of fun. So that's where it all started as far as positive reinforcement training. Oddly enough, if I can add this, oddly enough, after learning that, I did not carry it over to my own animals. I mean, it, it, it's, it was very bizarre. And, and I've talked to other people who have said that. And it's, I think it's because, you know, I wasn't raised that way. We weren't raised to, to train, typically to train our pets and companions in that method. So even though I learned it in school, I didn't transfer it over to my dog <laughs> or to my horse. It's, it's very interesting. So anyway, from, um, uh, the exotic animal training program, we had to do an internship. So I did an intern at Bush Gardens in Van Nuys, California, and it was a bird park. And they had all sorts of species of birds on display. And they also had a small uh, bird show and uh, which featured macaws and cockatoos. And there again, even though we were positive now, we were positive reinforcement trainers, Bush Gardens had in the bird show a group of um, Gallerita Galleritas. So they were, you know, they, I assume they were wild cockatoos. And they had been trained by um, a company, not by Bush Gardens, not by the staff at Bush Gardens, but they were trained off site and they came to Bush Gardens to perform in the, in the show. And yet it was not with positive reinforcement. We had to hold a stick and <laughs> I think about it now. And, and if a bird got out of line, we would kind of, you know, tap on the, on the table there and the bird would immediately jump back to where, where we were supposed to be. It was, Again, um, a strange scenario. So positive reinforcement training was out there, but it wasn't pervasive like it is today. Then I moved on to um, being a, I don't want to say trainer because I really didn't do any training, but I did work with dolphins at a uh, amusement park in Santa Clara, California, Marriott's Great America, it was called at that time. And um, they had two dolphins 
and an animal show as well. So they had uh, they hired contractors. The dolphins were contracted. There was a little. There was an elephant that was contracted. Um, there was a sea lion that was contracted, and they all kind of mushed together into a you know half hour, forty minute show. And so I ended up getting a job working with the dolphins. And from there, I moved to um, the, the Philippines because I was married at the time. Moved to the Philippines. And my husband was going to school, at vet school there. And we collected some cockatoos while we were there. And I brought them back to the U.S. for breeding purposes. And um, also, I, I worked at a dolphinarium in Germany <laughs> during that span of years. And that was an interesting, an interesting um, gig as well. And then when I finally got back to the U.S., I just concentrated on breeding cockatoos for the companion market. So that's my short, uneventful history <laughs> in the training world. Well, most definitely don't want to draw attention to timelines, uh, but acknowledging that uh, when you were at Moorpark College, uh, Ryan Cartledge was not a thing. <laughs> <laughs> oh, gee, Ryan. Uh, you missed so much back in the day. <laughs> That's pretty funny. Yeah, well, it's changed so much, Ryan. It's just unbelievable how much this industry has changed. To the, for the better, by the way. <laughs> so that's and, I'm, and I'm so curious. You said that you, you learned this information. You, you trained a rat to uh, do the Olympics. <laughs> yes. And, but then you didn't, you didn't bring this over to your own animals. And it, remi- it reminded me of uh, stories I've heard from trainers who run classes, who uh, teach targeted training, and then they see the dogs in the car parks just... Uh, doing undesirable behaviors from a human perspective and thinking target training the stuff that those clients were just doing in this class would be so helpful right now and the clients have no idea how to manage their dogs um how has that lesson kind of stuck with you it just made me think about generalization and doing that with our animals and and how we also need for our clients to uh consider well I, what's what strikes me is more personal i what strikes me is why didn't i generalize this new education to other animals and um i i still don't have a concrete answer for that and how to um present that to maybe a client if you if you're a dog trainer and you have a client how to present that and say you know this there this can um influence your whole life not just your dog and i think i don't know how to do that i i i don't i think karen pryor's um don't shoot the dog what is a good book to read because it it shows us that she she brings in the outside world and and not and not just animals but people and how positive reinforcement training can can influence all of this um so you know i wish i had an answer for you <laughs> but i don't I'd rather you say that than try to make one up on the spot, which I often try and do. Um, and, and so working with dolphins, I imagine there must have been some valuable learning opportunities whilst you're in Germany and, and working with them in, in the States there. Can you think of any stories that stick out from those times that still stick with you today? Yeah. Uh, yes. And the trainers that I who I worked with, it was a husband and wife team, and they were part of this contract business. It was the business was owned by Ralph Quinlan, and he had dolphin shows. He was located in North Carolina, and he had dolphin shows contracted out around the U.S. And he would hire staff that weren't necessarily trainers. He would, you know, train them to be dolphin handlers or trainers, whatever you want to call it at that time. And so these two people were there and that's who I worked under. And I remember um, they were trying to get a dolphin to go through to the holding tank. 
And it was a little tiny pool to begin with. I mean, the regular show pool and then the holding pool, they were both small. But in any case, one dolphin would go in very easily. The other dolphin wouldn't. And they tried and tried and tried. And one of the trainers got so angry that he he got the the one dolphin who went into the holding tank nicely that dolphin went in and he was so angry that he took a whole big bucket of fish and he dumped it into the holding pool and yelled at the other dolphin you're not getting anything i mean that was the type of training and it stuck with me to this day and um that was an example of of um, people who didn't know what they were doing and an and a employer who didn't care about the animals to educate the staff well enough in this in this type of training. So it wasn't pretty. It wasn't fun. Um, I ended up leaving because it wasn't fun after a while. So there's an example. <laughs> and then so did, did you find mentors in that time? Was no, really people. no, he didn't. No, I did not. And even in Germany, in Germany, I knew a little bit more about um, what I was doing as far as with training. And um, I saw the same abuse going on in Germany um, and uh, to a chimpanzee. And I was not in a position to uh, say much about it. Again, another husband and wife team. When, you know, you don't have much power when you're up against that. Uh, so I left there after a year. So yeah, there, it's not a pretty sight out there in a lot of, you know, and it probably still isn't today. Um, so I decided to get out of training altogether. And so you were in the Philippines, you uh, did something that you might not be able to do today and bring a whole bunch of cockatoos back to the States. Yeah, yeah. So and, I was, and- I wasn't, I'm going to be very honest with you here and your listening audience that, uh, again, I was ignorant. I was naive. Uh, I didn't, wasn't paying attention to conservation at that time in my life. And I did not understand how, how these birds how I was able to even buy these birds. I didn't, I didn't understand that they'd been poached. I didn't understand, you know, that hundreds had died so I could have these six or whatever, I, you know, amount I was, I was acquiring. And it's a very shameful part of my past. I certainly know better now. Um, I attribute it to, to being immature and not paying attention to what goes on in the world of conservation. Um, so yes, <laughs> that said, yes, I did. I acquired cockatoos and I came back thinking, because at that time, cockatoos were being captured and sold to the pet trade here in the U.S. And I thought, well, I'll have a, a positive influence by breeding birds here and selling them hand-raised. That way they won't go out and catch them in the wild, right? So that was my my thought. And um, I was a very, very small breeder. You know, I maybe pr- would produce maybe six birds a year. It wasn't a big deal. But uh, yeah, so that's what I did for many, many years. And about 20 years ago, I stopped breeding and started concentrating on training, uh, learning about training, teaching people how to live successfully with their parrot. And that has led me down a wonderful path that I'm delighted that has opened up to me and, and brought in all these mentors and wonderful, knowledgeable people that I can learn from. We, we appreciate your, your bravery in sharing this with us. And I'm kind of reminded of uh, what Margie Alonso calls her giving a shit a meter. Mm-hmm. <laughs> and that, and that you're, you're kind of a piece of that and you're mm-hmm. giving a shit a meter <laughs> kind yeah. of allows you to, to, to bravely talk about these things whilst other people might uh, feel a little bit vulnerable mm-hmm. in, in sharing that information. How, how do you view that part of your life now? Like how does that add to you as a person? Yeah, well, I I view it as a, a 72-year-old woman looking back at a 20, you know, 5-year-old woman who didn't know her 
what from her what, you know, <laughs> you know, she did, uh, as a very young, naive uh, woman. And I don't, I don't blame what I did. I don't blame myself for that. I, it's a growing experience. I, uh, I'm certainly not proud of it. And it also has made me acutely aware of what's happening today in that poaching is still happening. And, uh, and we're still fighting that. So I, I support, uh, I support World Parrot Trust a great deal, as a matter of fact, and uh, and other, um, the Katala Foundation that's, that is uh, working with conservation of the Philippine cockatoo, I support them. So that's how I am alleviating some of my guilt, maybe, <laughs> or, or, you know, just trying to help now. And I, I feel it reminds me of a lot of guests who come on here and share that they all started with aversive training techniques and had that uh, switch over later in life and mm-hmm. uh, how, how that's be- helped them become maybe a more compassionate person now mm-hmm. uh, and, and, and looking at others and, and understanding other people's journeys. Um, so once again, thank you for sharing that. So w- w- bring us back to when you did make that switch. W- what happened when you decided to stop breeding and, and how did your journey right. continue at that point? Yeah. yeah, well, you know, it was, it was gradual. It wasn't, it wasn't an overnight thing, but um, I just decided that it was, wasn't fair to the birds. I saw, started seeing problems that people were having with cockatoos specifically um, because they can be a a challenging animal to live with and uh, especially hand-raised ones Uh, so I decided not to not to add to the population anymore and again uh, start focusing more on training and, and helping people live successfully once again with their parrot. And so um, I eventually moved up here to, to Oregon, and that's when I uh, – well, first of all, in, in California, in Grass Valley, California, we started holding uh, one- and two-day seminars, and people would come, and I'd have speakers come in, and we'd talk about cockatoos and training and, and conservation and then we, I moved here to Oregon, and I kept doing the same thing, although on a, on a – well, not a smaller scale, but we don't have as many people. So Barbara Heidenreich, Heidenreich and I and Pam Clark started doing our positive parrot training retreats, and we've had – six or seven of them. We've stopped doing them now last year. Two years ago was our last one. But we would have people come and bring their own parrot. And uh, we it would be a four or five day workshop and people would work with their birds and we would coach them and then they would work with the cockatoos and we'd poach, you know, coach them. And then we'd free fly the birds out, not their birds, but free fly the cockatoos outside. And so it was really a lot of fun. It, it uh, by the end of the five days, it was it was quite a lovely community that that had been established, and hopefully, people took home some some lessons that they learned while they were here with their parents. Yeah, well, we definitely felt the ripples from that down here in New Zealand, watching <laughs> uh, videos shared on social media. So now, in in twenty twenty, you're you're a sought after speaker. Uh, you're, I believe, uh, got some things in the pipeline that I don't know if you can or can't talk about, so I'll leave it up to you to share. Um, but for anyone that wants to learn more about what you're doing in 2020 and uh, get in touch or find you online, is there anywhere that you can direct them? Uh, well, I'm, I have a Facebook page. It's called Positive Parrot. No, it's called, excuse me, it's called Cockatoo Downs Positive Parrot Training Retreat. I didn't name that. Somebody who was at the t- retreat named it and started the Facebook page. So I just kept it. And uh, I, I'm on there infrequently. I, I don't do Facebook much anymore. And I'm not a big, I'm not on social media all that much, but they can do that. They can contact me by email, which is chris, C-H, chris.shank at iCloud.com. And uh, yeah, so those two methods. And are there uh, any plans for future events at Cockatoos Down? What does the future of Cockatoos Down look like? (laughs) Yeah. Well, what we started last year is we had Peggy Hogan here for 
one workshop. It was a two-day workshop, and that was two years ago. And we had a group of 10 people come, and and we Peggy is, is such a motivating force, and she's such a great teacher. And she was excited to work with the cockatoos. So I said, why don't we do, why don't we have a com- combination? Because we have a donkey available. We have a horse available. We have, I have a friend who brought her two mini horses. So we have the equids available to work. And we also have the cockatoos available to work. So let's just combine that and and have talks. We're in the house talking and having little mini lectures. And then we go outside and practice what we were just talking about and on the various species that are uh, available to us. And it went exceedingly well, I thought, (laughs) humbly, I say. And um, somehow I said to Peggy at one point, why don't we have Susan, ask Susan Friedman here? And, oh, my gosh, we thought that was a great idea, too. And we asked her. And my mind just exploded because she accepted as she came. And it was, it, was, um, it was another great learning experience for us all. And that was last summer. And we were going to do it again in June. But, ta-da, you know what happened next. So... Hopefully, we will um, transfer that workshop to 2021, in the summer of 2021, when everybody is healthy and we've got a vaccine out there and we don't have to worry about anything, right? (laughs) And and agree with uh, comments about Peggy's motivating (laughs) force-ness. Force-ness doesn't sound like a good word, does it? But, But I believe Peggy's actually the ripple responsible for this podcast and originally sent the email I can't remember now it's been a while um so how do people come to this event do they is there because you said it's just a small collection of people yeah and I will say because um we don't when the retreat would happen we would use the barn the bird barn to present the speakers um here we just we've scaled I've scaled way back and so it it's almost like invitation only it's it's sort of become that um, what we like to focus on right now is uh, are people who have a a, an, a background and a knowledge not you know not. PhD knowledge, but a knowledge of training and um, and the four quadrants and that type of thing, because we want to kind of jump right in and not have to lay out the foundation. We want the foundation already there in people's heads. D- does that make sense? So they come here, and and then we can expand on on new ideas and new information that's maybe come down the pike. And we're kind of all on the same page. So, um, so yeah. So right now, it's it, it, it was through Pam's clients. Some of the clients would be interested. Um, some of Peggy's clients would be interested. That type of thing. And then we will ask them to come if they want. Yeah. Exclusive. I like it. Hey. <laughs> <laughs> Oh, yeah. (laughs) Hoity-toity. Thanks so much for sharing everything so far, Chris. We Mm -hmm. love hearing about what we call people's behavioral odysseys, so appreciate you sharing. Moving forward, when we caught up for our our pre-podcast catch-up, we discussed talking about free-flying your parrots and whether you, your resources, and your birds are good candidates or not. Uh, And we discussed four considerations that you have when preparing or that you want to offer our listeners when preparing and training a bird for free flight. So I'm keen to dive into these. Did you want to add anything to get started on this topic or just dive straight into these four considerations? Yeah, let's just just go and see what happens. (laughs) All right. So number one was parents educating. Parents education. Okay, so what we're talking about here is... um, I'm free flying. I free flew. I have free fly. I free fly hand raised cockatoos and I free fly parent raised cockatoos. So I guess what you and I were discussing um, was the 
training of the parent-raised cockatoos. And um, I, I don't know if you want to go further down, down that road. Is that okay? So I am switching my views on parrots as companions. Um, I am becoming to believe and I am promoting that parrots should be parent raised if they are going to go into the companion home. And we won't go into that. That's a whole nother, you know, lecture, <laughs> I guess. But there's more and more evidence that um, hand raising parrots doesn't do them any good and doesn't do the owner, the parrot companion owner any good either as far as behavior problems and that type of thing. So I have uh, two generations of three generations of parent raised cockatoos that I have trained to free fly to support the fact that a bird does not have to be hand raised to be a successful free flyer because a lot, not a lot, I don't know them all, but some free flight parrot trainers that I know of promote that parrots should be hand raised to be successful free fly. So I've, said not no not necessarily <laughs> and I saw so last year uh two years many years ago eight years ago I had a pair of little corellids bare-eyed cockatoos uh they had two offspring the same clutch and they are now eight years later very successful the birds that were parent raised eight years ago are now stupendous stupendously trained free flight cockatoos those birds had, last year went on to raise their own chick, another little Corella, who I decided to make a project out of so that I could present this material not only in the written form, but also in uh, speaking engagements if, if anybody was interested. So we had the, I had the parent raised Corellas raised their chick. I did not handle the chick at all in the nest. I peeked in occasionally to make sure everything was okay. The birds um, raised the chick up to fledge. In the meantime, these parents had been trained, are trained free flyers. So I would work them in the aviary while their chick was in the nest box. And we would, you know, do targeting. We, you know, I'd have them station. I'd have them fly from perch to perch. I'd have them fly to my hand. I even had them fly outside while their chick was in the nest box. So we kept that up. By the time the chick came out, she um, would, she didn't want anything to do with me, of course. Oh, and by the way, I have other people work the parents. So people they know, people they don't know, because they were also used in the training retreats. So they're very used to working with other folks. And um, so the chick came out, didn't want much to do with me. And that's fine. I still went in there and worked with the with the parents. The parents are modeling, right? They're modeling to their chick that this creature is okay. You get goodies from this creature <laughs> if you if you uh, you know want to cooperate. And eventually, after whatever you know, two or three months, whatever it is, the the baby, her name's Star. She's a year old now. She um, is recall trained. She stations on the perch. She targets. Um, we're now teaching, I'm now teaching her to go into a bird crate, a, you know, a carry crate. And uh, she flies outside wonderfully well. It was a, it was a magnificent experience for me. And um, to watch how both the parents taught her and I taught her. And, and our team effort has created this lovely little being who is a cockatoo, knows she's a cockatoo, but yet wants to interact with people as well. That's what I like. So I guess there's multiple people listening to this show who this has relevance for. Uh, those who might be in the position such as you were with, was it Stella? Uh, her name's Star. <laughs> that was Star, close. Sorry. That's good. Star. No, <laughs> same thing. Um, and have access to uh, do what some of the things that you've just described. Um, there are those that are potentially working with 
pet parrot owners uh, who uh, may be requesting their services to, mm -hmm. to work or free flight. Mm -hmm. um, and there might be those who are training up birds that they've purchased for their own uh, reasons. Um, so w what do you have to say to the pet parrot consultants? Right. I'm, first of all, here to say I am not, that's not, and that's underlined, I am not promoting free flight. Um, it takes a, it takes knowledge of the bird, it takes knowledge of the species, it takes knowledge of your surroundings, it takes training a high, a high amount of training knowledge. And I just don't want to say to everyone, now I know people who listen to you have a lot more training knowledge than the average bear, right? Um, so I wouldn't have a problem with, with that. It's, it's people who go out and buy a bird specifically because they, they just want a bird in the house and, oh, look at this. You can maybe even fly them outside. How cool. Uh, no, that's, that's not what I'm promoting or to the, the audience I'm talking to. Um, so if you, and I think some of the trainers, the free flight trainers out there certainly will embrace those people and tr teach them to train their bird. Um, okay, fine. If that's, if that's the way they want to go, then, then go for it. My concern is I don't like online training uh, of, of free flight. It has to be, for me personally, has to be the trainer, the coach, the mentor it has to be in person so that they can see what's going on with the bird, can understand how the how skilled the trainer is or unskilled the trainer is. They can actually do um, training outside together and, and, you know, that type of thing. It's sort of like a... You know how falconers have to have a uh, what? What's it called? I don't know. They they need a. a coach. I don't know what the correct word is, but let's just call it a mentor for. Okay, yeah, a mentor, <laughs> and, and and in order to get their falconry license, they have to learn from a actual human being right there in front of them, and that's the way I feel it should be with parrots. And I also have a. a, a problems with people who single who fly their birds singly with all by itself by the you know that's to me is very dangerous i have a problem with people taking their birds um their bird away from home to fly in um strange or an un, um, unfamiliar territory and yes i know there's success stories out there all over the place me personally, I, I just am not comfortable doing that. There's, you know, parrots, all birds learn their territory and learn through others, learn through their flock members and things like that. Um, and taking a bird who's not used to, uh, who, who's used to maybe flying around their house area that they know very well, outside the house area very well, and then all of a sudden dumping, you know, going to a soccer field or something that they've never seen before and, and, and expecting them to fly successfully. Sure, they're, they, they, will, they may fly successfully, but will they be comfortable? How stressful is that for that bird? I mean, we need to think of not just how, how cool it is to watch our birds fly. We need to also think how, about their welfare. And I think that gets lost in the mix uh, in a, a lot of the time. And so do you have people reaching out to you online and saying you, you, no. just because you're not, you're not putting that content out, people are like... Yeah, no, I'm real low-key <laughs> um, low about my free flight. And the most... Um, attention it's gotten I suppose is through the training retreats because the videos get out there and uh, and I so I, if an occasional person does ask me do you know do you train would you help me train my bird I say no <laughs> do you know of any trainers I say no <laughs> and I, I pretty much explain what I just explained to you and either they get the message or they don't and and have you has any part of your so you've done the trainers retreats. Um, I'm 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 just curious 
to leverage this opportunity to have someone on the podcast show with, with 40 years of experience um, and not just at training cockatoos and training animals and working with animals but of <laughs> let's get all meta here of life and and I feel like there is um, I'm gonna own it and label it this thing called trainer's dilemma where people come and they're like hey yo I have this animal let's you know one that might be familiar with the podcast audience I have an aggressive dog um, and I need your help with it um, and I want to use a shock collar to like teach him to, to be no um, and and that a dilemma where uh, yep, we kind of want to change people's pers perspective, but additionally, in my personal opinion, this is Ryan's opinion, everyone, the, the best thing to do there might be to listen rather than to, and try to understand what this person's problems are and, and kind of how uh, they, in their specific unique situation, could um, you could add the most value. And that might not be just jumping in and being like, hey, ethics and all of this kind of stuff. Um, <laughs> I wish that the podcast audience could see our guest's face sometimes. <laughs> <laughs> Chris's face is like, what the <laughs> hell are you talking about, Ryan? <laughs> no, but I'm just curious about, about your, your perspective from life. I, and, and I can um, see that you're, you know, because free flight parrots is a big controversial, is that, a, is that an okay word to use? It, it's, it's a controversial area of um, pet parrot ownership. Um, and, and so for the consultants out there, and I know that you don't do this and I know that you don't um, have people come to you for this reason, but I'm just curious to hear your thoughts. Like they, they say, hey, I want to free flight my bird. And you're like, well, my ethics say that that's probably not the best option for you right now. But I know that you, you're going to explore this path, whether with, with me or without me. Like what, what advice do you have to those people doing those consults? Like how can they best help these people and more importantly, their parents? Well, you know, if they if they want to listen to me uh, and my ideas and thoughts about free flight, wonderful. Then I will explain that to them, or and or I just direct them to other trainers who have the same perspective that I do. So Hillary Hankey is one who's written a fantastic articles about free flight, the problems with free flight, the wonderfulness of free flight, the this, that, and the other of free flight. And it's right there in black and white. And that's from a person who knows of what she speaks and, um, and doesn't make it into this lovely fantasy of, you know, fly free, my parrot. It's, it's, it's nitty gritty. It's the, the good and the bad that goes along with this. And I think that's what we need to emphasize is that it's all not peaches and roses out there. Your bird can get killed. My birds have gotten killed. I've lost birds in the past. Certainly I have over 40 years, you know, and, um, Gosh, instead, can you maybe make a nice aviary that the bird could fly in and you could you could play with the bird in there. You could practice, you know, recalls and things like that. So uh, I would say, please don't get captivated by this lovely vision that a lot of these free flyer people will put out there and trainers as well, especially with the spectacular videos that I've seen, um, you know, these beautiful macaws flying and, uh, you know, in, in, um, in the canyons and out in the fields. I mean, they're just, they are spectacular and it can take your breath away and it can certainly, um, put a fog in front of a, a companion parrot person's eyes and say, well, gee, I can do that, <laughs> right? So, yeah. Seeing Michael Jordan play basketball and picking up a basketball and being like, yes, I'm going to be Michael <laughs> Jordan now. Here I go. And then you exactly. shoot the ball and you get an air ball and you're like, hang on, what? That's yeah. not, that wasn't supposed to happen. <laughs> exactly, exactly. <laughs> And, and, and yes, free flying is controversial. It's becoming more popular because of uh, social media and, um, and that scares me. Um, there's, there's been books on free flight training I've seen that are absolutely atrocious. <laughs> and uh, so, yeah, it's, it's like anything, a new, I guess, like a new 
anything new. It's it's going to take time to develop into something that's worthwhile and and um, something you can have trust in. Right now, I don't know. I don't. I don't know. I don't know where that comment is leading, Ryan. I don't. <laughs> just well, there was there was some great takeaways in there. I mean, yeah, yeah you said direct potential. Um, human learners who come to you to relevant resources. We've done a podcast with Hilary Hanke and we talked about this subject. It was years ago. I think it was like 2017. Mm-hmm. Um, so you can go listen to that and, and it's, her articles are linked from that podcast. She might have done some more recent ones as well, but you can find all of those on her blog. Um, you also mentioned there, uh, you know, with this, it's, it's a matter of life and death. <laughs> it can be. And it quite often is. Mm-hmm. Um, or you don't know because you never see your bird again. That's right. <laughs> That's right. Um, you know, and and maybe, do you think making it, making those consequences, having a frank conversation about those, is helpful for people? Yeah, I wonder. You know, uh, <laughs> we have a, a as people, we have a tendency to have a lot of bias going on, right? We hear what we want to hear, and um, I don't know. It, it can't hurt, uh, but I don't know how helpful it is. You know, we I had a, a one of a, a person who came to one of our workshops a couple of years ago, she was flying two, um, what were they? Military macaws, I believe they are. And she would take them and she, and she knew about training. She wasn't great about training. I mean, she had a, a knowledge of it and they were hand raised birds and she would take them up Oh, two or three hours away from where she lived, and she would fly them with a, another man who raises macaws, and he free flies all his birds, <clears throat> and they would meet out in a field of some type, and uh, that's how, pretty much, how she trained her birds. And in my mind, that's not training. You know, she would take them up there; they would um, fly around with this man's macaws as a flock and then they would come back and become trained (laughs) you know air quotes there and uh, one day the birds flew off with the flock and only one of her macaws came back and was never found again so um, things like that happen and that's and that could be prevented and that was from poor training not I'm not blaming her at all it's just that the knowledge is not out there um well it's out there but she didn't manage to find it or again she was um again blinded by the success apparent success of this man and his macaws who by the way also lost one of his macaws not too long ago so you know that's just the nature of the of the beast as it stands right now and and another great suggestion you made I thought anyway was to offer people what they can do instead which was uh, make a nice aviary aviary yeah <laughs> so um, some great suggestions there now back to <laughs> go full circle back to the start uh, your, your, what, what you're suggesting in 2020 July 2020 it might be different in December tw- 2020 who knows uh, but what you're suggesting in July 2020 is uh, parent raised birds where you're doing training with the parents you're doing training with the chicks uh, the, the chicks are getting social learning they're learning natural behaviours uh, and you're also inviting other human to come and interact with those birds and, and that's that's all in your personal opinion am I understanding this correctly the best <laughs> we don't use recipes but a potentially good recipe for a large majority of individual parents to uh well it would be nice I I don't I I'm smart enough to know that that's not going to happen and I do know that the finished product if you want to call <laughs> your flyer a product is a bird who is extremely um talented and self-sufficient enough to free fly and as well as interact with with me as their companion um i don't see it as a as a way uh, how am i going to say this i guess it just boils down to um i 
I, it would take a whole new in, infrastructure to, to do that, right? Because you've got to get parents who are going to raise the birds. You, get, you know, it's a whole big deal when it's pretty darn easy now to have uh, just go out and get a little hand-raised bird and raise them up yourself and go out and free fly. Yeah. <clears throat> Um, so I don't know what the answer is. Again, I don't know what the answer is. It just is my experience for now. My personal experience is I would much rather have a parent raised cockatoo period, whether the bird flies or not. Um, and at the same time, I would rather have a parent raised cockatoo or I have shown that parent raised cockatoos can be successful free flyers. Right, so if, you, if you're listening to this episode, uh, chances are your parents weren't raised. Your your parents your parents weren't raised by their parents. Your your bird potentially wasn't raised by its parents. It might have been a hand raised bird, depending on where you got it from. Um, and if it was raised by its parents, um, some of the uh, ingredients that can lean themselves towards helping that bird be a successful candidate for free flight. Uh, like the ones we mentioned before, working with positive reinforcement with the parents and the chicks, allowing all of those social learnings to occur, natural behaviours, getting other humans to work with that chick when it's young. Um, chances of your chick falling into that category might be relatively slim, which means that there are some alternative options you can offer your birds, like building a nice big aviary for it, um, continuing to educate yourself, understanding the risks involved with, with free flying, uh, and I guess I guess that's that's that black and white. We don't know, and I, and I like that you don't know what the answers are, but you're asking the questions. I think that's you know where else can we be? Yeah, this is new territory as far as I'm concerned. I think even bringing up the idea of uh, parent raised parrots as companions, regardless of whether they free fly or not, is new territory. And uh, like I said before, you know, the, in fact, there was. Uh, there's a veterinarian, Dr. Uh, Van Zeeland, I believe her name is. She's an avian vet, and she gave a presentation not too long ago, and she she says that there's indications and possible research that shows that um, parent raised, uh, excuse me, hand raised birds, parrots are more susceptible to feather destruction behavior. You know, and and so that is huge to me. I mean, none of my parent raised birds do any feather destruction. Well, actually, no, none of them do. <laughs> but but that doesn't mean anything actually in the in the big picture. But I'm glad that that in fact the Netherlands uh, have outlawed outlawed hand raising parrots. Now I don't know how many you know how they enforce that. But um, again, it's 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 getting back to the ethics and the welfare of these birds that I don't need to get into right now. But I'm becoming very sensitive to having parrots as companions in the first place and how we can make their lives even better than I perceive that they are now. And that is through parent raised, parent raising. We have to celebrate the approximation, I guess, that conversations are happening in the Netherlands, which Mm -hmm. um, have led to uh, the current legislation they have in place. How did that come about in the Netherlands? Do you mm-hmm. know? No, I don't. I sure don't. And uh, like I say, uh, how many people follow it? I'm sure breeders had a lot to say about it. It, it would be, in fact, it, it would be very interesting to find out. Mm. Well, I mean, I don't think people even follow legislation with regards to dog ownership. No. <laughs> right. Right. You're right. Yeah. What are you going to do? <laughs> So, uh, but but I but I'd be interested personally to learn more about what conversations happened in the Netherlands to get the policy makers to to listen mm-hmm. uh, and, and to make those considerations and, and curious what we can learn from what conversations are happening there. Hey, we're, we're ending, we're heading towards the ending okay. of this episode. <laughs> we're ending Ooh. right now. Okay, good. Um, no, no, but before we just wrap up uh, with 
getting your thoughts about, and, and I think you've already said it, but we'll get you to restate it, um, <laughs> your thoughts about what you want to see happen in the next five to ten years. Do you have any final comments or offerings to make on final on finals? Conversation today? Final finals? Uh, I do. I actually I have a little list, a little tiny list, and uh, on the whole, I absolutely see the training world, the animal training world as headed in the right direction. My gosh, the changes that have been happening is, especially in the last decade, is like lightning speed as far as I'm concerned. And the the information available and and um, people like Susan Friedman and, and Dr. Joe Lang, who comes on and, and talks about, you know, human behavior, but yet he's done research with with animals and and how that's applied with Barbara Heidenreich and, and what she uses in her her training it's um and it's all out there for us <laughs> to to absorb and you get excited about and and Ryan Cartledge who has this huge library of things to um to read and listen to that it, it, it we have no excuse other than you know if if we claim we don't know anything about training we have no excuse. I'm sorry. So anyway, as far as that goes, I think um, I think that's all I need to say about that. I and again, I'd like to uh, emphasize that parrots should be parent raised, <laughs> and and um, and if 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 you are interested in free flight, please 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 do homework before you decide to go down that road. And uh, yeah, that's about it. Well, once again, thank you so much for for sharing everything today, Chris. Uh, I had a lot of fun getting to know you better uh, and, and hearing hearing your perspectives. I feel like we just scratched the surface of forty years of uh, learning and growing. Um, and as we mentioned, for those that want to get in touch, the best place to go is the Cockatoo Downs Facebook page. Uh, and you mentioned your email earlier, which we will include in the show notes for this episode. So let's take this opportunity to express gratitude to you. Uh, we appreciate you. you coming on the show today. Thank you so much. It's been absolute my pleasure, Ryan. Thank you so much for having me, and I look forward to learning more from you. We do, of course, really appreciate all of you tuning in today as well. And if you have enjoyed this episode and you were interested in carrying on the conversation about working with our animals in the most positive, funnest, choice-rich ways, then as mentioned at the start of this episode, the Animal Training Academy community is waiting for you. Head on over to www.animaltrainingacademy.com and click on the membership button in the main menu to learn more about what members are describing as the Netflix social media platform for behavior geeks. That's it for this episode though. We're going to wrap it up there. Thanks again so much everyone for listening. You'll hear from us again soon.